Uh, good morning and welcome to the New America Foundation. Um, my name is Mark Schmidt. I'm a uh, senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, and I think I'm a senior research fellow here at, at New America, where I worked for a number of years, uh, a couple years ago. Um, and we've uh, pulled Andres Martinez, uh, the vice president of New America, and uh, Elizabeth Weingarten and I have, have pulled together uh, a, a good panel on what's really going on with money and politics in 2012. And, and we, uh, we call it beyond sticker shock because the idea is to kind of get beyond just the basic idea of, oh my gosh, there's a huge amount of money uh, here in, um, in, in politics. I, I remember when I first got involved in this issue in 1996, I was working on the Hill and uh, my boss wanted to do a big speech about it. And we were, I remember writing this whole section of like how outrageous it was that it was a, a billion, $1 billion would be spent on the election in, in 1996. And of course, now that begins to seem like, you know, the line from, um, you know, Dr. Evil's uh, one mil demand for $1 million to uh, not take over the world. So what we're going to do here is uh, uh, a little couple very brief presentations and then really an open-ended uh, panel discussion. And uh, the first presentation will be uh, Michael Scherer from uh, Time Magazine will kind of give us the landscape of money in politics right now, what's really happening. Um, I'm going to uh, run through a, a little bit of uh, some of the questions I, that, that I, I think we might want to be asking that are sort of the beyond sticker shock questions. Do that pretty quickly. Um, and then, we'll, uh, and then uh, we'll be joined by Trevor Potter, Catherine Mangue Ward from uh, who's a uh, Trevor Potter who's a uh, partner at Kaplan and Drysdale and often often uh, known as uh, the lawyer for Stephen Colbert's Super PAC. Um, probably many of us have known him for many years, but now uh, the world knows him. Um, and uh, and Catherine Mangue Ward is a is a uh, fellow here at New America and a the managing editor of Reason Magazine. So hopefully, in addition to moderating, she will also provide some provocation. Um, which is always always useful. So uh, with, uh, with no more ado, I'm going to uh, thank you all for coming and turn it over to Michael. I'm one who knew, uh, who knew, who knew Trevor when he was a uh, lawyer for John McCain, which I thought was a pretty important job, but nothing like being a lawyer for Stephen Colbert. Um, maybe one day I can say I work for Comedy Central too and people will <laughs> be impressed. I, uh, so I, I just want to give a, a brief overview. This is actually a graphic that we ran in Time Magazine uh, at the end of, um, uh, of July this summer, trying our best at that moment in time to project out where the money would come from and what the differences would be in terms of the various sides. And there are a couple points we were trying to make in this graphic. One that um, there is a, a real difference in uh, political money strategy that these campaigns are employing this cycle. Um, the Obama campaign is heavily reliant on small dollars, individual dollars, regulated money, what you, what is, that is contributions under $2,500 um, from individuals uh, that the campaign then has total control over and can spend as they want. Um, the, the exception here is the Priorities USA, which you can barely see because of the chairs, um, which we were saying maybe would make uh, 60 million. Earlier, priorities had been saying they'd wanted to make 100 million and they had to pair that back. There just weren't a lot of uh, wealthy liberals and Democrats coming forward to give them money. In, in recent uh, weeks, there's been a little bit of a turnaround there. They, they've been picking up steam, but it's nothing compared to what the Republicans have had on their side. And there are a few different factors going on here. Traditionally, it's easier to raise money uh, for a no than for a yes. So it, it's easier to raise money when you're out of power because you have an angry donor base who really wants to get back in power and are motivated. And that's definitely true with Republicans this year. Um, you have a, a large class of mostly uh, private business entrepreneurs who have ponied up significant amounts of money for various different reasons. Some of them are just friends of Mitt Romney who know him from private equity days, who support him and like him and want to be there. Some of them are hedge fund givers who were big supporters of Barack Obama in 2008, but have uh, soured on Obama and, and, and switched teams. Some come from industries that have significant government interests. Uh, oil, gas, and coal are one of them. Restore Futures uh, received a bunch of money from payday lenders who were very concerned about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau regulating them uh, and are hoping for a Romney win, uh, which would, would ease some of that. Um, on, the, on the Democratic side, there just isn't that collection of people right now. Now, it doesn't mean that at no point in the future will there be a large amount of very wealthy liberals, because they're out there who will pony up money. It's just in this cycle, it's, it's very uneven. The saving grace of the president is that he is, as he proved in 2008, uniquely able to raise enormous amounts of money in very small amounts from 
in political terms, enormous amounts of people. And we're, we're talking now, I think we're up at 3 million donors for his campaign. And um, just to give you an idea of, of how it differs from what Romney's been raising, um, this, is, this is through reports that came out, the primary uh, fundraising through the end of August. Um, Barack Obama had raised 147 million or 34% of his primary dollars from people who gave under $200. Uh, so these are people mostly going online or responding to text messages or uh, being hit up by campaign aides as, as they you know, walk precincts. And these donations, I, depends on the, on the month, but they average you know, in, the, in the $15, $20, $30 range. They're not, they're not much more than that. But it adds up to an enormous amount of money, uh, $147 million or 34% of his take. Romney, um, so far this cycle, in a moment where you would think there's a lot of grassroots furies out there on the Republican side, has been really disappointing among small dollar donors. Much more disappointing than John McCain was in 2008, which was uh, uh, arguably a more difficult year for Republicans to get their base going. Uh, he's raised $40 million, or 18% of his, his, his take. Within the campaign, though, on the, on the high end, something, the reverse has happened. Uh, Barack Obama is actually ma raising less money this time than he did in 2008 as a sitting president from people who max out on their donations. In 2008, it was $2,300, the max you could give. Uh, this cycle, it's $2,500. But, but so far, or through the end of August, Obama had raised $70 million, uh, or just 16% of his haul from that group. Romney, on the other hand, is incredibly good at raising money from people who can part with $2,500 uh, after taxes. Um, he's raised $102 million, uh, or 46%, almost half of his haul through the end of August, was coming from people who had, who had maxed out on their donations. And that's reflected also in the Super PAC. Many of the people who are fundraisers and bundlers for uh, Romney uh, give the max to him, bundle from their friends and colleagues and people they work with. Uh, other money, and then write a check for 100000 or 200000 or more um, to, to one of the super PACs on the outside. So the question is sort of, what does this mean for politics? Is this, is this increase in the outside dollar spending transforming politics going forward? And I think the answer so far is a little complicated. The, the driving force, one of the driving forces behind this is a Supreme Court decision, which Trevor can talk about much better than me, called Citizens United, and then some lower court decisions, which basically allowed outside money uh, much easier access to our airwaves uh, right before an election. So there, the barriers that were there historically in the post-Watergate era that prevented uh, corporations and very wealthy people from pooling their money to spend huge amounts on television ads right before an election have, have um, largely gone away. Uh, and and that, is, that has unleashed you know, this outside spending spree. I, I am guessing, and I don't know, but I am guessing that in a few months when we look back on this election, we will say that the peak of the power of these super PACs may have come not in the general election, but in the primaries in which they really transformed the Republican primary. Um, in the case of two candidates Romney was running against, uh, Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum, almost certainly those candidates would not have stayed in the race as long as they did, would not have been able to be viable candidates um, after losing several contests in, in, in each case uh, without basically a, a millionaire or two or far or a billionaire uh, uh, backing them with checks as high as $5 million or, or, or $2,500,000. Um, and as a result, the Republican primary was much more prolonged than it would have been. Uh, Romney and his friends had to spend much more money than they expected defending him. Uh, in, in that early time, in those in those early uh, months, and and really the whole dynamic of what we're used to in early presidential politics, where it's uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and we've got a nominee, was sort of upended for a few weeks there. Um, since then, uh, the super PAC stepped in in a huge way this summer. When when Romney won, wins the nomination, he doesn't have the infrastructure, the fundraising base, and he hasn't really raised the money that he needs to compete with Obama at that point, he relied heavily on super PACs uh, through the summer months to do his advertising. Um, uh, of course, this was not technically coordinated advertising, and Trevor can get into the, the legal realities and fictions there. Um, uh, and, and it had some clear, obvious positive effect in holding parity with the president as he unleashed a sort of blistering attack against uh, Romney this summer. Um, 
but it also has shown to have clear weaknesses, I think, and both campaigns will tell you this. Uh, the super PAC advertising, because it was not coordinated, didn't follow a simple single narrative like the Obama advertising did. The Obama campaign built a, a storyline starting in, Mar in, in April that tried to portray Romney as a certain type of person, and then they presented as the months went on new evidence. There's the Bain Capital chapter, his period in Massachusetts, his time in Massachusetts, the uh, offshore tax havens, and they built this storyline in these swing states that the super PACs, because they were operating independently, just weren't able to build. And, and in some cases, and Obama campaign people point out this out to me, you had um, situations in which uh, two different super PACs would have uh, conflicting ads up in the same market, both supporting Mitt Romney. You'd have one ad that says, uh, uh, um, um, I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, but one ad that says essentially that Barack Obama is a really nice guy who just couldn't get the job done. And that's one of the attacks that's been used against him. And then in the next commercial break, you'll have an ad that says, no, Barack Obama was never a nice guy. He's a radical socialist, green energy lunatic who's trying to take your job. Um, and, and the result is, like, the, the, the more money actually didn't feed into a larger uh, narrative in a way that I think the Romney campaign uh, would have preferred. Um, a second reason that um, the super PAC money is less effective now is that under uh, uh, FEC rules or FCC rules, um, the super PACs uh, campaigns are able to get lowest available rate for their advertising, their television advertising right now, because we're in the window right before an election. Super PACs are not able to do that. So super PACs buying the same number of points in the same market are spending far more, sometimes you know, twice or three times as much as a campaign is to get the same uh, um, money. The third reason I think that you're seeing uh, uh, super PACs being less effective now than they were early on is that in just the last month or two, Obama, because we're getting close to the election, people are pay paying more attention to it because we had the conventions, are, are waking up and giving more money in small dollars in a way that you don't really see happening in the super PACs, at least not yet. I mean, it may be that a bunch of people are going to come in at the last minute with $10 million checks. But we haven't really seen that. And so the small dollar fundraising model has actually been able to expand nicely for Obama as we get close to the end. And on the other side, Romney had to spend a good por portion of September when he should have been out campaigning, going to fundraisers, trying to collect these $2,500 checks. Um, you know, he, was, he was being very successful at raising a lot of money, but it really was a strategic disadvantage um, at, at that point in the race. Um, we can get into uh, uh, some of the other questions here, but, but I, I, the other thing I would say is that I do think there is going to be an interesting uh, political legacy question of this election. We have had, in all the elections I've covered, and I started doing campaign finance reporting for Mother Jones Magazine in 2000, um, when it was a totally different world of soft money, but uh, there have always been wealthy people with large checks putting money into our political system in some way or another. Um, and so it, it technically is not a brand new ball game. But I think the increased visibility of the super PACs, the degree to which they Campaigns can now basically raise money for the super PACs if they follow a certain set of fictional rules. And, and the visibility of these ads, whereas a lot of the money fundraising before from wealthy people went into things you didn't see on TV, has raised this as an issue profile for um, the public. And you've seen uh, you know, the president a few weeks ago come out and say that he would like to see a, explore the possibility of a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, which is a pretty striking when, when a politician goes the, you know, pulls the constitutional amendment card, you know, um, uh, at least in th this case, I think that he sees it as a real political winner for him over the long haul. And, and there have been some polling that came out recently that, um, that there is concern among the public. There are not a lot of people who think these giant checks are, are good. Um, we ha what we haven't seen yet, and which I fully expect and if this regime continues, over another decade or so are the real corruption scandals which tend to follow this sort of thing. But you need time for that to happen. You need the money to be given and then the politician to act, repay the donor, and then the questions to be raised, um, whether it's actually prosecutable corruption or just the clear appearance of corruption that, that makes um, the voting public upset. There's also a lot of, my last point is, there's a lot of concern among Democrats specifically that uh, going into 2016, and after what happened in the Republican primary this time, there is a huge barrier uh, to
to overcome. Um, Obama was always going to be pretty much fine. He, he's probably going to be outspent in this election, um, but, but he's an incumbent sitting president with enormous fundraising potential. Um, you know, he was not going to be at a huge disadvantage. But if you have uh, a playing field next time in which either both parties are running from the ground up or Democrats are running against a, a Republican incumbent from the ground up, it's, it's difficult to see how any candidate can really get into the race without having a few very wealthy friends. Um, and that really changes that, uh, the whole way politics is done in these early primary states, that basically you need your billionaire or your 100 millionaire. Um, and there's a real concern among Democrats that that will self-select the candidates, they're able to get into the race, um, or worse, sort of lead the country into this, uh, on the path towards a situation which not just wealthy people, not just people who can give $2,500 checks, but people who can give a million dollar or $5 million checks or $10 million checks, I mean, the numbers will keep going up, um, have a, uh, increasing control over the political process. Uh, and and, uh, and, and, and uh, Democrats, at least right now that I've talked to, are, are interested in provoking a backlash against that, that potential. So I'll, I'll hand the mic back. Thank you, Michael. That was fantastic. Um, I just want to—I just want to sort of set some context here by um, uh, ta really talking about some of the questions we might ask about how things are really different in 2012. As as Michael said, this is there have always been wealthy contributors to politics, but certainly some things are different. Um, and those things are not just Citizens United, although that's certainly part of it. The the Speech Now decision, uh, which really d most directly created super PACs, is part of it. The the absence of rules about coordination between campaigns and super PACs is a is a big part of it. And together, they've turned us they've returned us to a world that, you know, on the face of it, looks a lot like the pre Watergate world of you know, campaigns being supported often by a relatively small number of, of wealthy individuals, with the big difference being that, uh, th that, you know, the sticker shock, actually, that the number is is probably six or seven billion in total. The number I was able to find in pre-Watergate 1968 or so was about 300 billion being spent on, 300 million, I'm sorry, being spent on all, uh, on all, camp all federal campaigns. Of course, that's uh, kind of before the 70s inflation, so I'd have to really uh, work that out. Um, and these, and th what, th what this creates is a situation of, you know, where the enormous economic inequality we see is reinforced by political inequality. I mean, it's not 1%, it's not the 1% that's giving to campaigns, it's, it's, it's about a fifth of the top 1% that's, that's giving $200 or more uh, to campaigns, and an even smaller amount um, uh, giving $2,500 or more. So you really have, the, you know, the potential for economic and political inequality kind of reinforcing themselves in a in a uh, kind of self-perpetuating structure. And you have situations, that, that I like to not talk about corruption and appearance of corruption so much as the term Lawrence L Larry Lessig uses, which is dependence. You have situations where elected officials are going to be wholly dependent on, on individual donors. Um, and that creates all kinds of potential for uh, for the public interest to to not be served. Um, I just want to. I, I have a little paper uh, out front um, uh, with that title beyond sticker shock, and I, and what it really tries to do is lay out what are some questions that we want to be asking, particularly after the election when we begin to have the real data. I mean, this is this is a funny time to have this conversation because we're sort of in the middle of the stream. Uh, but once we really begin to get the data after the election and the final reports and and, and some time to analyze it, analyze it. I think the things we want to be looking at, and these questions kind of are both for journalists and, and academic researchers about money and politics, and then also for people thinking about what are the, what are the reforms, what are the changes you do want to make in the future, um, and kind of go in order from that. First question would be, how has money really affected competition this year? As Michael pointed out, money did an interesting thing. Super PAC money did an interesting thing in the Republican primaries. It actually kept some campaigns competitive where in the past they wouldn't be. I have a great, I sometimes use a great quote from 1988. Uh, a guy who had been, uh, I think, Dukakis's campaign chair uh, said, uh, candidates don't, he was talking about presidential primaries, he said candidates don't lose elections, they run out of money and can't get their airplanes off the ground. Um, and that's, that's a very good description of presidential politics in past cycles. Uh, in fact, probably the reason Dukakis was the Democratic nominee in 1988 was because all the other guys ran out of money. Um, 
And, uh, and, and this isn't limited, of course, to presidential politics, and we shouldn't just, uh, just limit it to presidential politics. So the interesting question would be, how, how was, was competition affected in congressional races, for example? Were, were, were there more competitive candidates as a result of actually the massive flow of money, both, both large money and, in fact, small contributions? M were more candidates able to reach kind of the threshold of competitiveness, which is really how political scientists think of, uh, of money in politics. It's not like a, you know, it's not like playing the card game of war where if you have a higher number, you win. It's really a pretty subtle thing. Do you reach the threshold where you can be heard, and at a certain point, extra money isn't doing you any good? So uh, the real question is how many reach? It's probably about probably last year the average non-incumbent winner in a congressional race uh, raised 1.5 million. That's people who won either an open seat or defeated a an incumbent. You want to look at how many people reached basically that level, and how many candidates were that were actually overwhelmed, had a shot, but were overwhelmed by by super PAC spending. We want to look, it's a very subtle and complicated question, really how does money affect polarization, political polarization? And that really hasn't, it d doesn't really get talked about enough, um, but clearly that's a big part of what's going on in Washington right now. You have b some of the big super PAC donors are clearly much more ideologically driven, somebody like Sheldon Adelson or Foster Fries, um, much more ideologically driven than the soft money donors of the late 1990s. How does that affect things? And these big money air, you know, air battles tend to create kind of intractable positions. So the question would be, has that affecting polarization? That's a much more subtle question than the one uh, above. Another interesting question is, you know, do these, do, uh, the automatic instinct is to go to broadcast ads. Broadcast ads are the big cost of politics. They always will be. It's the only way to reach that that person who is, you know, they're not seeking out political information, but they will vote, and they're moral, and they're, and they're waverable. Um, now, that's probably less than 5% of the people who will vote uh, in November, and it's probably shrinking as we, again, as we become polarized. So that in a, in a, in a base election, actually mo getting your vote out becomes vastly more important than getting to that, to that 5%. So a lot of the uh, money activities that go into the kinds of organizations that are either based on getting the vote out or actually based on reducing the vote, there's a new organization called True the Vote that's uh, clearly intended to, 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 to make it difficult for people to vote uh, and things like that. We, we need to begin to look at that, that. And those are organizations that are often operate under a very different legal set of legal structures than the classic you know, uh, PACs. Um, we do want to look at have corporations change their behavior. What, what a lot of people thought would really happen after Citizens United when people would say, you know, ExxonMobil is going to put $11 billion into the, these, uh, these super PACs generally hasn't happened. Uh, you know, corporations have been about 17 percent of the, of the total uh, spending. Most of those are privately held corporations, so it doesn't, you know, the individuals who own them could give from their own pocket or the corporation uh, doesn't, doesn't matter that much. But what, what have corporations done? Have they been have they become a little more polarized themselves? I've, I've looked at some of the data. Most corporations have generally, corporations like to play both sides of the fence, with a few exceptions. Um, a lot of them have been at about 60-40, one party or the other. Uh, this year, a lot of them are a little closer to 80-20. Um, you may be seeing a little more partisanship, or you may be seeing, as in the case of, for example, of Aetna, uh, where we found out about some of the outside contributions that they were making, that they're kind of bipartisan on the face of it. and partisan in in the non-disclosed uh, contributions they're able to make through uh, 501c4s. Um, it is interesting to know, uh, it, it's kind of news that there's really are still some downsides to, to putting money through super PACs. It used to, it used to, there used to be considerable downsides because you couldn't do, you, you know, you couldn't control the message and candidates don't like not being able to control the message. Now you can clearly control the message. But the fact that you're not getting the lowest unit rate, as Michael talked about, the fact that the fact that the super PACs are not able uh, to buy airtime at the same price, uh, ProPublica study showed that the uh, Romney super PACs were paying six times as much as the Obama campaign for the same time totally blunts that advantage. That's an interesting development and may make people think differently about super PACs. Uh, do small donors still matter in the campaign? Clearly, as Michael pointed out in data from the Campaign Finance Institute shows, small donors are still a very significant part of at least the Obama campaign. Really be interesting to see how many congressional candidates 
actually are able to build a base of small donors. And that extends to what is really one of the most interesting areas of reform, which is can we, can we use that to build reform initiatives that enhance the value of small donors, that encourage candidates to seek out small donors and enhance the value of small donors, similar to New York City's uh, uh, matching fund system for small donors. There's a great system in Minnesota, which unfortunately has been defunded, but uh, for a long time gave people, in a sense, a voucher uh, for a small contribution. It was an instantly refundable uh, tax tax credit. Uh, a lot of people uh, have, have moved to thinking that's a really viable way of uh, thinking about, about campaigns. Uh, political scientists Norm Ornstein, Michael Malbin, Tony Corrado, and Tom Mann put out uh, a couple years ago this uh, project called the Age, Re Reform in the Age of Network Campaigns that really called for boosting small donors. Some of the congressional legislation, um, the um, Empower Citizens Act, I think it's called, that was just introduced, uh, are really based on that model. Um, so if small donors are really still a viable way of, uh, of building a campaign, boosting them could be a really valuable way of thinking about, about reform, unless the, the, you know, the huge outside money actually overwhelms that. So that's, you know, that's a question in itself. Is if, that, if, if the blasts of money from super PACs kind of overwhelm the small donors, that's not going to work. That leads some people to think you really need uh, either a constitutional amendment to reverse Citizens United or uh, the, the court to change its mind in, before some of these things can work. But that's an empirical question. And then finally, just two, two last questions that really go to the politics of it. The first is, you know, will campaign finance reform ever be a bipartisan project again? For years and years it was. Trevor worked for Senator McCain. Um, there's a great legacy of that. Before, Senate, before there was McCain-Feingold, there was Goldwater-Boren. Uh, not only bipartisan, but actually representing fairly conservative Republicans as well as uh, 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 as well as as well as liberal as well as more moderate ones, um, that hasn't that's not the case right now. That e even the uh, Disclose Act, a lot of Republic, a lot of conservatives used to say they were for disclosure, but nothing else. Uh, even the Disclose Act to approve disclosure now has zero uh, Republican co-sponsors. It had two in the in the previous uh, in the previous Congress. But it's possible, I think, after a, you know after a significant shakeup in this election, maybe after people realize that super PACs aren't that valuable after all, uh, you know, there could be some some rethinking of the of the political alignments of that. And finally, the last piece, what Michael alluded to is, you know, does the public actually care about this now? It is a, I mean, I've been around this issue for 15 years. Other people have been, uh, have been for longer. Uh, it's been, we've been waiting for people to care. And, and all of a sudden, the poll, recent polling by Stan Greenberg and others suggests the public really does care quite passionately. Uh, Greenberg had a line that said, the public doesn't see uh, money in politics as a distraction from the economy. It is the economy. Um, so that that connection to economic inequality is strong. On the other hand, that, that public passion may make it harder to build the bipartisan uh, alliances uh, that traditionally have been, have been needed. So to my mind, those are, th those are kind of, that's kind of the range of, of questions that we need to be looking at after the election uh, ends. So now what we will do <laughs> is answer all those questions. Um, we will uh, we'll all come up here, and, and uh, Catherine will uh, lead this uh, open-ended discussion and, and stump us. Thank you for uh, kicking us off with 10 million questions to answer. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be able to cover all of those in our, in our short time here. Um, so I guess just to start out, I think we're going to get into some of the great, like, nitty-gritty of this. We're really going to get down and dirty in the, in the campaign finance details, and I'm looking forward to that. But um, maybe we could start just indulge a libertarian. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about free speech. We, nobody mentioned that in their opening remarks. Perfectly reasonable. But, um, you know, there's been, you know, this sort of macro debate in addition to the, to the real, like, hard money stuff about campaign finance, which is, is speech freer now? Is it the right kind of speech? Is it, you know, is corporate speech speech at all? Um, and maybe since since Trevor has been our, our silent partner until now, he can he can kick us off with that. Just indulge me with a little little First Amendment worship. Well, I think that's the right place to start because uh, we have a Supreme Court that, starting in the Buckley decision uh, back in the '70s, and, and obviously much more recently in Citizens United. Uh, has used the First Amendment uh, as a way uh, to disqualify a range of government uh, restraints on both contributions and spending. Uh, the first thing to say, of course, is we're all Americans. We all believe in the First Amendment. Uh, the question is, what is the First Amendment? And one of the things that I point out uh, when I think about this is that 
we have a Supreme Court over the course of the last hundred years which has had a whole range of views of what the First Amendment required and didn't require. So it isn't a black and white question. You had a Supreme Court which for 35 years after the Buckley case said that corporations didn't have the same First Amendment free speech rights as individuals and labor unions didn't as well. And then with the change of one justice changed all that doctrine and decided, oops, that's wrong, they do. Uh, if you added up the number of justices who had voted over those years saying that they didn't have those rights compared to those who do, the number of justices who say they don't uh, uh, is the winner. So it isn't a clear yes or no. Uh, the Supreme Court has made this distinction between contributions and expenditures for the First Amendment and has said, uh, well, they've said if you stand on the street corner, that's speech. Fine, we all know that. Um, if you stand there with a amplified microphone bullhorn, that's still speech, even though you paid for it. Um, but they've said that, so they've said that line of logic means an individual and now a corporation standing on a street corner or using their money for their own speech, radio ads, TV ads, the hundreds of millions of dollars we're talking about, that's all First Amendment free speech. On the other hand, the same individual who turns around and takes the same money can be prevented from giving it to the candidate because the court says the First Amendment speech there is lesser. You are taking your money and you're handing it to someone else to spend and for them to decide what message they want, the, the point uh, that has been made about the super PAC versus the candidates. And therefore, it's not really your speech. It's in some symbolic sense of saying, yes, I support this candidate by giving them my money, but that could be you know, $100 rather than a million. So the court has said you can limit what individuals give to some other person or, or entity. So what's a super PAC? Is it your own free speech? Is it giving a contribution to this entity where other people decide what to say and what to spend? Can it therefore be limited, contrary to what the court said in speech now? These are all the First Amendment questions that we deal with uh, in when we get under the 50,000 foot level of the First Amendment allows free speech. Does it allow unlimited contributions? The courts have said no. Uh, is giving all this money to super PACs a contribution? I, I think there's a, a good argument that it is. And finally, the reason this matters is that we have a, we hope, uh, a democracy, a republic, a constitutional form of government where at the end of the day the President and the Congress have to make decisions on matters. And we don't want them being, in its grossest form, we don't want them being bought off. And I, I think the notion of a democracy is that people, citizens, voters get to set policy, not uh, special, what we would call special interests, other groups would call uh, a, other countries w would call uh, oligarchs. I, I got a uh, call from a German reporter uh, this summer and he said, I want to interview you about the role of the oligarchs in the election. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, wrong country. <laughs> uh, but you know, it, we, there is this, uh, this concept fundamentally that you want a Congress that represents the will of the people and isn't bought off. And that's where reform started 100 years ago, was the notion that you had the senator from Standard Oil. Uh, and you shouldn't. You should have the senator representing the citizens of New Jersey. And Standard Oil was only one of the constituents of that senator. Uh, so underlying this is the tension, I think, sometimes between the First Amendment when it comes to spending unlimited money versus corruption and the danger of corruption and people feeling that their government and its policies have been bought by a, a tiny minority of voters who represent a sizable economic interest. Can I comment on this? Of course. I, I mean, I think I, I, I yield, I don't, I don't, I don't want to let libertarians own the First Amendment. <laughs> you know? I, I mean, I, I care about the First Amendment as well, and, I, and, and it's, why, it's one reason why I think you know, incentives that boost small donors and other voices are, are, are a very important part of the, of the solution. But I see the, I see the issue as not just you know, First Amendment or no First Amendment. It's really an issue of how do we draw the boundaries around an election? 
What do, what, do, what do you call the bounds of an election? That's the real challenge here. And you know, we've always had, in thinking about the First Amendment, a kind of a, what some scholars call electoral exceptionalism. Right? There's a, there's, we have rules. Elections are a structured process to make sure that they're fair and, the, and, that, and that people can be heard. That's why you can't you know, campaign within 75 feet of a, of, a, of a voting booth, for example, which is certainly a restriction on, on speech, but it's an important one. Uh, and we've always we accept that, that contribution limits are, are, are a way of, of balancing that out. Then the question really becomes, what, what's out there that's really a contribution, to the, really about the election? What, what might as well be considered a, contrib uh, you know, a, a contribution directly to the election? And what's external speech? That was the real challenge about the issue ad, the electioneering communications in mccain and so forth. What's, what's, what's really all about just influencing the election, and what's just free for all speech outside of that zone. And we've had what the challenge is is really defining that zone well. And I and I that's what I think it's about, not just, you know, do you value free speech or not? If I could add to that, I think that's a, a nice analogy. If you look at so who's in the zone, uh, we have established a uh, constitution that says citizens vote. Non citizens do not vote. Uh, that you know, we came from, we were worried about European uh, governments intervening in, in our new republic. Uh, so we, the inner circle is that individual citizens are the people who vote. Then we've decided that if you have a green card, you can contribute to candidates, uh, but, but not vote. Uh, at the, so you look at this and say, okay, foreigners can't have a role in our election. The laws say they can't contribute, they can't spend money, uh, they can't make an independent expenditure. That's all reserved to individuals. Then I think you have to say, so where are corporations in the middle of all this? They're not individuals. They are presumably are not foreigners, although they may be owned by foreign corporations. But that line of conversation assumes that the government should have a role in deciding who is in the circle. Uh, whether it's who has the First Amendment rights or the rights to speak or the right to vote, it's, it's all a piece of that, who gets to determine who our leaders are. And I think that's what the, the conversation becomes. Uh, Michael, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, um, in your earlier remarks, you kind of described this um, problem for the campaigns of the, the fragmented narrative. When you have many voices um, and they're, they're independently funded and can't be coordinated, um, sometimes the message is muddied. As you were describing it, I thought it actually sounded kind of great that there's this, you know, that there's this sort of two models, and one is this, you know, very disciplined. There's one story. This is the only story the public gets to hear, um, and that's because of the way the money is flowing, right? It's very specific to to how the dollars are moving around. And then in this other scenario, we have kind of a bunch of people hollering, um, and and uh, you know. You could say that the money makes the voices louder. It's the megaphone. Uh, but I guess I wonder, you gave a sort of purely strategic analysis. But I'd like you to kind of bring some, some of your own judgment to it. Is this a good thing for the, for the process, for democracy, for America? Um, it's clearly a bad thing for the Romney campaign in this cycle. But right. Yeah, no, the Romney campaign would say it's a bad thing. Maybe it's more aesthetically pleasing to have lots of people screaming instead of uh, one narrative. I, I mean, if I were to answer the question, uh, is, it, is it better or worse? I, I think I would probably go back to, just for a way of judging that, um, how well the public interest is served vis-a-vis uh, -vis the issue of corruption and the appearance of corruption, um, which is something that, as a journalist, like there's, there's two things you, you look for here. First is you're frustrated by the lack of transparency. What we haven't talked about here, we're talking about super PACs. There's tons of C4 or 501C4 money going into these campaigns. Like same giant checks, in many cases the same wealthy individuals. There could be wealthy individuals we don't even know are on the radar. They're only giving privately. Um, it's a huge problem. And it's a huge problem just for a public accountability reason. And, and if they're adding to the color and chorus of democracy, but they're doing it in a way that fundamentally conceals who is speaking um, in a way that could distort the process, I, I do think that's, that's something the public, uh, or me as a journalist, should be concerned about. I want to know, um, just for accountability's sake, who is trying to um, uh, uh, push an election one way or the other. Um, and then, and the, other, the other issue is this issue of, uh, uh, I mean, as I understand the Supreme Court decisions and the, and the history here, it, 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 the First Amendment 
butts up against this issue of corruption, the appearance of corruption, where you said that we don't want our officials being bribed. And the real issue with the super PACs, as I see it this cycle, is that in, in Citizens United, the majority opinion said, as a statement of fact, that if you are a third party group, like a super PAC, and you're giving money, uh, uh, spending money on your own independently without technical coordination, there is no corruption or appearance of corruption. Um, it's just not a concern. We're, we're going to rule out that possibility. And I, I don't think the American people would agree with that. I think if you look at the plain facts of the issue, the idea that because someone who is a friend of Mitt Romney, who gives money at an event where Mitt Romney speaks to a third party group, to a group that says they're only going to do what the Mitt Romney campaign is publicly saying they're going to do in terms of public messaging, that it, that it ends up being a fictional wall uh, between the campaigns and, and these third party groups. And, and the real danger, and we don't know how it's going to play out, but the real danger is that you know, the politician who gets elected because of uh, contributions from one wealthy person, when he gets into office, you know, either does something that is not in necessarily in the public interest, but in the interest of repaying that donor. Um, and, and again, if that happens, I think it, it, like the aesthetic beauty of having lots of people chiming in on my television as opposed to just one uh, 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 probably is, is, is less, less important. How do you score that, though, with this, um, with the claim that you made earlier that some of these big donors are increasingly, uh, they're in it for the ideology, right? That's so they're, they're not right. in it because right. they want, you know, their company to get a tax break when it, when it comes out the far side. Uh, well, well uh, at the very least, we think that we, we will take as a, as, a, as a stipulation at this moment in this debate that at least some of these guys who give money are doing it just because they believe in something. And, and maybe that's... Uh, starry-eyed, but I, I think it's real that at least in some cases, this is really not about material consideration. It's not, not to say that their beliefs don't sometimes line up with material considerations, but that um, in those cases, I think it's a little harder to tell this story of corruption. You can still tell a story of influence. You can tell, still tell a story of, uh, of um, you know, like the whole point of giving money to a candidate somewhere along the line is to change the way policy is made in this country. So that's never going to go away. But you know, what do we do with the Sheldon Adelsons? What do we do with the, the guys who are just saying, like, listen, I like policies X, Y, and Z, and I want to see more of that. Go for it, buddy. Yeah, I, I, Sheldon Adelson is probably a bad example, I think, to use in that, in that case. Uh, just because, the, the, I mean, he gave an interview recently with Politico in which he said, you know, the, there's the possibility of these federal investigations into him. He said, they're outrageous, they're false, they're not true. And I'm convinced that if Obama wins, they're going to pursue these. And if, and so I'm giving money to defend myself. We'll have imaginary very, ideological yeah, right. donor. But, but I think, but why not use the real one? No, but I think your point. <laughs> because the real one has already been fought to death. And I think this is a, this no, is no, a legitimate question. I there are people who do this And the way I would ideology. answer it is, I, I think, and having spent time in this, you're right. And I think sometimes the press gets it wrong in sort of assuming that anybody who gives money is, is, is a bad person in it for themselves. And, that, and that's just the assumption of the narrative. You, know, you do the list of the 10 you know, big bad money people who are out to buy the election, right? And, 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 and what the reality is, is there are very different motivations um, from very different types of people. There are basically ideological philanthropists who give every year um, because they feel you know, they're wealthy people their, their careers are over. They feel this is how they can do good in the world. They don't really want anything back. Even if they get a tax break from a politician, they don't care about it. I mean, it's just not their motivating factor. The problem from a policy standpoint, from a legal standpoint, is how do you, how do you distinguish from the outset the one guy from the other guy? I mean, I think it's important in telling the story to try and distinguish one guy from the other guy. But a, a case of Adelson is a, is a good case in that he clearly has uh, ideological views, philanthropic goals in terms of changing policies around the world and the situation around the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran and other things. Um, he also has very real business interests. Uh, he also has personal interests, possibly, I don't know the state of these investigations, but possibly w with federal investigators. Um, and so you, c I don't, I just wouldn't know as a policy matter how to say, Okay, if you if you check the the box that says I'm really just in it for nothing, then therefore you can give more money than the guy who works for, 
the payday lender, which is a pretty clear, more clear-cut case, who's facing a huge regulatory burden, who's pulling their money for Restore Our Future, um, because Romney has promised them that if he's elected, you know, the Elizabeth Warren plan for payday lending will not, will not go into effect. Trevor, you've been kind of itching to get in here. You want to you wanna dive in? Well, I mean, some of this resembles the conversation we literally had 100 years ago when the Wall Street Trust selected Theodore Roosevelt uh, because they thought that he would not enforce these new uh, antitrust laws against them. That was you know, ideological. They didn't like William Jennings Bryan. They probably thought he was a socialist. Uh, but their, their view was that we want our thinking uh, in the White House and, and in the Justice Department, and we want someone who sees the economy our way. You know, is that a business interest? Is that a philosophical, ideological interest? Um, you know, after, after the election, the great line that came out of that was Henry Clay Frick, who said about Roosevelt, we bought the son of a bitch, he just didn't stay bought. Um, and Roosevelt ended up saying we ought to get rid of private money in presidential elections. We ought to have uh, public funding out of the Treasury because trust corporations shouldn't be deciding who the president is. I, I think if you look back at the Supreme Court in, in the Citizens United case, what you see uh, is a court that, that has two very different views, the dissent and majority, over what's happening. And we see it played out this year. We have your view, um, which is a perfectly, I think, you know, respectable view of, of, a, of aspirational uh, that there will be all these independent groups and they will be speaking and they will be saying what they want to say and that the candidates may like it, they may dislike it, but it's going to be independent, it's going to be fully disclosed, and it's not going to be corrupting because it's independent. Then you have the minority, which I, I think got the reality of some of the spending, maybe most of it this year, but not all of it, correct. And their view was, wait a minute, uh, you know, these are going to be funded by giant corporations that have a specific legislative interest or individuals who own giant corporations, and that's why they're going to give so much money. Uh, it turns out it's not fully disclosed. It turns out it's not independent of candidates uh, in any common sense definition of independent, and thus edges to and, and perhaps crosses the line to being corrupting. But those are two different views of the world. as, as um, uh, Stephen said in his dissent, you know, it's interesting, when I talk about corporations, I think of international oil companies. When the majority talks about corporations, they talk about the corner hairdresser, uh, who just happens to be incorporated. So it, it sort of depended on which end of the telescope you look through, how you saw this. And I think in this election, we're seeing examples of both, which goes to Michael's question then of so how do you write a law that covers both? say I am so rarely accused of being the, the one with the hopeful aspirational view of politics, but it's really, it's actually kind of refreshing. I mean, I, I, I guess what I'm interested in is, you know, we've sort of had this very compelling explanation of how hard it is to draw bright lines, right? How everything is muddled, how the corner hairdresser and the international oil company are, you know, in some sense fundamentally the same and yet clearly very different, but how their speech is, you know, in some sense speech and in some sense not. And I would add, you know, what exactly is the difference between, you know, when I go in the ballot box and I, and I vote purely on my personal economic self-interest? If I just say, I don't want my taxes to be higher and I think this guy's going to make them lower, why is that different than someone saying, I don't want the taxes on my corporation to be higher and I, and I you know, I think this will make them lower? Um, but all of this sounds to me like an argument to, to stop trying to write these incredibly complex rules that people just work around. So I guess I'm interested, maybe you could step in here and just say, you know, what is the case for rules? What is the vision of rules that work? Well, I mean, I think part of it, let's, let's take a, a slightly different example on the, this distinction between ideological and self-interested donors, because I don't think that's that important. Let's say, for example, you have hedge fund, some hedge fund donor who lives in Connecticut, gave a lot of money to Obama in 2008 because he's socially liberal, uh, environmentalist, all those things. Now he's turned around, he's decided Obama hates bankers, it's all awful, he's giving the same amount of money to Romney. He's, he's still a donor, he's, he's got his interests either way. His economic interest, I mean, I don't, I don't really care about that distinction so much. And frankly, if a politician's views, I find it, I actually found it quite shocking to see Governor Romney in a speech with Sheldon Adelson in the very front row, taking a set of positions about the Middle East that, to say the least, box him in in a way that presidents don't usually 
want to be boxed in on foreign policy. I mean, general, I mean, without taking a position on any of those particular positions, it was, a, it was a rather tight commitment that Mitt Romney made with a donor nodding in the front row. I, I'm as troubled by that as if he makes a commitment to end investigations against Sheldon Adelson. Or I have uh, had an argument with a friend of mine of like, is, Sh is Sheldon Adelson more interested in destroying unions or, or supporting his, you know, the, he, he has other priorities as well. Um, I, I don't think it matters. So that I don't think the rules have to be that subtle. The rules are you want to create a structure where elected officials are not wholly dependent on a, on a given donor, are not largely dependent on a given donor. One of the rules, one of the principles I always use is you want you want them to be in a situation where if they're in office and that donor comes back and says, I really want XYZ, the elected official can say, as Senator McCain famously did, get out of my office. And if you can't say get out of my office because that money is actually very fundamentally important to your campaign, you have a problem. And that's the case for rules. So there I would make the Republican uh, plea for judicial modesty and say, look, the, this is complicated. I, the, the discussion we've had indicates that there's not a simple open and shut answer. Under our system of government, the tie ought to go to Congress in those circumstances. They're the ones who have been elected by the people, spent all this time on it, and came up with what they thought was a uh, law that would prevent corruption. And then you have you know, five justices saying, no, we, we actually we, we have a better way to do this. Uh, it seems to me that when you are in the middle of an area as murky as this, that it is appropriate for the courts to defer to Congress on the theory that they, as I think Justice O'Connor knew when she was still on the court, is the only justice who had ever been elected to anything or raised money in a campaign, that the members of the legislature, the members of the court, are going to have a better sense of what the dangers are here of corruption and, and how to avoid them. Michael, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, where you see Congress going on this issue. I mean, this is, you know, this is certainly something that Congress is not going to let lie in, in its status quo forever. Um, and you also mentioned in your remarks that there, there, there's sort of always been this money. It flows through the cracks. It, it moves in mysterious ways. Uh, what's, what's next in the, in the, you know, on the national level legislative? Mark's point was right, that right now it's not a bipartisan issue at all. It's a partisan issue in Congress. And so in the near term, I don't Im imagine much will happen. Um, that said, there are sort of fundamental forces in the electorate that would allow that to shift. I mean, one of the things we've had since the economic collapse is an economic populism on both sides of the ideological spectrum against the idea that banks always are getting favorable deals, that the wealthy are treated on a different, with a different set of rules than, than Main Street, the sort of Wall Street, Main Street thing, appeals almost equally to activists in the Tea Party and, um, and on the left, although they come to very different conclusions about what to do about it. Uh, that it seems to me, just on, from that, not talking about the leadership currently in Congress who is resistant to this, argues sort of obviously that you want more disclosure, right? If that's your concern as a first step, short of a constitutional amendment or getting new Supreme Court justices to overturn <laughs> since United, um, we do have an enormous problem now, not only in the timing of disclosures, um, often money will be spent, we won't know who spent the money on election until after the votes are cast. Um, we have all this dark money in 501c4s that are going for political ads uh, that we really have no access to who the donors are. Um, it, you know, Mitt Romney has said in um, one of the Republican debates that he would be for, I mean, in his ideal future system, um, the super PACs would merge with his campaign. Anybody could give him unlimited amounts of money, but there would be immediate disclosure of the money so that people would know and then be able to judge and track any concerns about corruption or the appearance of corruption. Um, my guess is that's sort of next place to go to. And, and in, in this age, the FEC uh, is a particularly um, dysfunctional body. Trevor can tell you more <laughs> uh, than me, but uh, you know, the, there is really no good enforcement mechanism we have. We've had for a while uh, for most of these things in any real time. And also the disclosure mechanisms, though they're improving somewhat, remain far behind what is possible today. I mean, it, it should be a, the case that as soon as you, as soon as they're cashing the check, there's no reason that that money can't show up in a database that is posted online um, from any group that's spending 
uh, uh, money to influence, influence elections. So that would be my guess of where you go next. I think, though, the other political thing that will happen here is that um, whatever the outcome of the election, Democrats intend to make this a populist appeal. They, they intend to use, and this is part of the Democratic narrative for years, that you know, I'm with the working guy against the, the fat cats, and we're going to help the working guy defeat the fat cats. I think Obama signaling in that interview, in a, it was an interview on Reddit, that he, would, um, uh, that he would pursue a constitutional amendment. Basically what he's saying there is not that I'm going to get a constitutional amendment passed because it's not going to happen anytime soon. He's saying that I'm going to go door to door on this and I'm going to make this a rallying cry across the country as a way of organizing support for my side. And I, the polls, some polls suggest there's, there's real, you know, you, you, could, you could win people over by that. You say, look, these guys are, get, are getting taken care of because, I mean, it used to be, this election is a little different, but it used to be just in the last few cycles that that was a bipartisan rallying cry, right? I'm with the common man. Republicans would say it too. John McCain ran on it to a large extent in 2008. Um, I'm against you know, the, the, the powers that be in Washington. I'm against the special interests in Washington. So, so th there's real potential, I think, for one party to really take this as a, a baton and, and use it as a way of mobilizing people. I, if I can just add to that, I mean, I think it, at the same time that the bipartisan uh, ground has has disappeared, the f it has become a much bigger issue among Democrats, and not only on the ground, but I mean, it's really worth noting. I mean, at the time of McCain-Feingold, well, Senator Feingold was a little bit Senator Feingold was sort of a pest in some ways to the Democratic leadership of 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 the Senate, and you know, there was a little bit. It was in many ways that was a miracle <laughs> that 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 legislation was 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 uh, quite a political miracle. But what you have now in the previous Congress, when Democrats controlled Congress uh, until 2010, you did have a majority of Democrats supporting the Fair Elections Now Act. And the leadership on that was coming from people like John Larson of Connecticut, who is the third ranking Democrat. I mean, it was, it's deeply embedded at the highest levels in a way that, uh, in my experience, I haven't really seen that before. It's been a more of a, a specialized interest sometimes at the legislative level. So I think, you know, if, you, if, you, if Democrats were to take back the House, uh, you know, potentially you'd have a very different political configuration, which Republicans would then have to uh, have to respond to, because I think I think they really care. I think in the, in the past, I think leaders would sometimes say, on the one hand, yeah, it was good to say they were for a campaign finance reform. On the other hand, like all incumbents, they know one way or another, I've mastered this system, and I don't really want to mess with it. So they were always halfway there. I think the commitment is much stronger. I also think it's going to be fascinating as you see people come into Congress who've had experience with state level systems like Arizona or, or, or Maine's or New York's that have worked well for them, state level public financing systems. I think you'll begin to see that just as, for example, people who've had experience with the New York City public financing system moving into the New York State Legislature has created a, a really significant momentum uh, for a similar reform in, in that legislature. And the other interesting question is, does the push for a constitutional amendment help build this uh, you know, momentum? Or does, it, or does it get in the, I think it gets in the way. Because I, I think it's one of those things where there's no steps along the way. You're basically telling people you can't do anything until you have a constitutional amendment. It's not like, for example, you had the Equal Rights Amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment failed, but it, there were lots of steps along the way that people could do. So it didn't need to pass in order for a lot of good things to happen. I think this one is just very different. If you go back and look at the Congress 10 years ago when McCain-Feingold was passed, uh, it's a very different Congress. I mean, the, there is a, a great deal of commentary about the fact that Congress has become more polarized and more centered on the left and right ends of the, the spectrum with much left, less in the middle. Uh, in, uh, in the early uh, 2000s, uh, John McCain carried 20% of the Republican Senate caucus with him. Uh, for McCain-Feingold. It passed in the House because a group of moderate Republicans voted for it against the wishes of their party leadership. Uh, most of those senators who voted for McCain-Feingold on the Republican side are gone. Uh, the, you know, the party has moved on, it's evolved, uh, it, it has, um, if you look at the leadership, you go back to the 90s when uh, I, I'd, by the way, forgotten about uh, Goldwater Boren, but, but there were perennially discussions about changing campaign finance, uh, and they took place in a world where someone like Bob Dole was the Republican leader, and he, w he was interested in making sure either that Republicans got a good deal or at least they didn't get a bad deal, 
but he was not opposed to the notion of campaign finance reform or legislation. Uh, in today's world, with Mitch McConnell as the Senate leader, uh, you know, he has spent years opposing uh, uh, legislation in this area and seeking to shut down the regulation we have. It is, it is uh, uh, at least uh, partially uh, because of Senator, maybe largely because of Senator McConnell, that we have an FEC that is deadlock 3-3 and unable to take any action because it takes four votes. And, there, and that's a, you know, talk about a supermajority requirement. That's a two-thirds requirement for the FEC to do anything, so we shouldn't be surprised that they don't. Uh, but having said that, and I think there really is a change uh, in the way Congress looks at this on partisan lines, uh, I still hold out hope that after the election uh, in a new Congress, they will at least take a look at the disclosure side because there the Supreme Court was crystal clear in Citizens United, eight to one, uh, the one part the minority joined in, saying that disclosure of all of this spending for issue ads as well as uh, election ads uh, or campaign ads, candidate ads, uh, was constitutional. And, and they went further and they said, and it's a good thing, it's of course necessary in a democracy, citizens should know who's paying for these ads, uh, shareholders should know what their corporations are up to so that they can judge them. Uh, and that's what we don't have, particularly when you get to the ads paid for by these nonprofits, uh, where there's, there's simply no disclosure of who the donors are. Uh, so uh, it seems to me that that's an area where not only have Republicans traditionally favored it, not only is it hard to argue against disclosure, uh, not only has the Supreme Court said it's a good thing and constitutional, but you're going to have a Congress that has just gone through an election with a lot of undisclosed money. And so that may be a situation where the ideology is trumped by the practical reality and candidates end up saying, you know, we ought to know where this, this is coming from. So just, just very briefly, and then I'll, I'll definitely um, get back to you, but uh, I think it's, it's sort of easy to agree about the importance of disclosure, and I think that's, that's why you're right to sort of look, in the, look into the future and say that might be where this debate is headed in general, but um, you know, there, there's some value to anonymous political speech, certainly, and you know, is the goal to get to a place where all speech regarding an election, all speech the 90 days before the election, whatever, whatever it is, however we set up the rules, where we really know where every dollar of funding for every word that's spoken about the election comes from. And if we're going to make exceptions, who gets those exceptions and why? And I think traditionally, God knows as a member of the media, I'm always very happy to get special treatment of all kinds in all places. But this has been a place where we've made an exception, basically just by saying, you know, we declare it thus, that, that large corporations that produce newspapers, magazines, whatever it is, they can say whatever they want whenever they want because the free press is important. But um, if we're talking about a world where disclosure really is so complete, where is the space for anonymous political speech? Where is the space for unpopular political speech? Um, you know, maybe, maybe the appropriate entity for that isn't a corporation, but um, you know, the Citizens United case was about this wacky video made by this wacky group that was really a pretty independent collection of people who, who just wanted to get their ideas out there. So, so what do we do with that? And I guess well, I'm, I'm interested, we'll, we'll get back to you, but I think you were gonna kind of chime in and, and I suspect it segues here, so yeah, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say on the, on the former point that the best thing for getting more action on this is a scandal. I mean, Watergate gave us um, the, 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 the regulatory framework we have um, the, the scandals, the foreign money scandals, the Hoff money scandals in the 90s gave us McCain-Feingold. Um, there's, a, there's a lag here. I fully expect that assuming this regime continues, at some point scandals come up that raise the attention of the cost of, of this. I, I think it's a good question you ask. I'm in a difficult position. I'm a journalist, right? So I'm biased towards more information. I understand that there is a theoretical value to the ability to have anonymous speech in, in a presidential contest, I guess I would just want to weigh that value against the risk of corruption. Um, and, and, uh, and, and my professional bias would suggest to me that the value of being anonymously able to say, this guy is rotten to the core in millions of dollars in television ads and never disclose who I am um, is, is almost always going to be outweighed by the value to the country of knowing who that person speaking is and why they're 
and why they're why they're saying it. But but I agree that it's a, it's not a there's no clear cut answer for that. I, I don't I guess understand why you think there's a value in someone being able to spend millions of dollars anonymously to run an ad saying someone is great or terrible. I understand the value of the ad um, and that speech. I understand the value of disclosure, which is to prevent corruption and so that voters can put it in context. But it wasn't clear to me what the value was of saying it's a good thing for democracy well, to be able to do that anonymously. Uh, among other things, just an unpopular view, which we have many, many reasons to want all kinds of unpopular views to be expressed in the political debate, especially around elections. And I might be a rich guy who just doesn't want to have the, the pain at cocktail parties of it, or I might be someone who genuinely, you know, fears for my personal safety, or, um, you know, I might, I might be someone who um, doesn't want my own reputation to sully the message that I'm conveying. I mean, I think there are plenty of good reasons that most people can understand. Anyone who's ever written anything under a pseudonym, uh, there are lots of reasons why you might want to communicate without adding your own identity to that message. But there are reasons. I'm not sure there are good reasons. I think some I mean, of them are good reasons. Well, uh, but I mean, we have now, as, as Justice Scalia said about the cocktail party example, more or less, that does not resemble the land of the, br the, uh, the brave. I, I, uh, uh, you clearly haven't been to the same cocktail parties. <laughs> uh, we are now going to open it up for questions. Uh, we've got a few minutes to take some inquiries from the audience. So who wants to uh, get alienated at cocktail parties? How about uh, in the red jacket over here? Hi, thanks for having the forum. I'm Eliza Newland Carney from Roll Call. Can you talk a little bit about the implications of the super PAC and also the nonprofit phenomenon for the down ballot races, the House and Senate races, the even state legislative races? My, my vote is that the high water of the super PAC at the presidential level was, as said earlier, in the primaries. The high water mark for the super PAC in the general election is going to be at the House and Senate level. And the simple reason is that you're looking at the numbers we saw up there. You're talking about literally billions of dollars being spent in the presidential. And a super PAC can make a difference, but it is not going to be the dominant speaker. In a, certainly in a House race, in a Senate race, a super PAC can, and we're seeing evidence that they're coming in and spending tens of millions of dollars. That may be more than the candidates themselves spend. So they can be the dominant speaker in those races. Uh, and I think that's a place where you see a greater uh, uh, evidence of, of the danger of corruption because an outside group can come in uh, and knock someone off because they have publicly declared them to be an enemy of their, their viewpoint, their uh, economic agenda, and then you go back to the next Congress and you say, look what happened to so-and-so. Uh, and we've seen that in, in um, uh, both parties' primaries already where there were super PACs that spent enormously in the Luger race, for instance. Uh, and on the Democratic side in the congressional race in, in Pennsylvania. And so after an election, those PACs then have a great deal of credibility in saying, if you don't want that to happen to you, you had better toe the line. And, and I think because of the, the dominant uh, position they can have in those races, it makes them more important there. The, the other thing I would say, and I, I don't know the answer to this, but it's something to look at. Um, there is a sort of accountability mechanism in politics from um, using falsehoods or making stuff up in ads or being unnecessarily mean in your ads because if it's coming from the candidate, uh, it, there's a reputational cost of, of doing something wrong uh, or, or of saying something that's untrue against your opponent. Um, Kathleen Hall Jamison at Annenberg has done a study looking at presidential super PACs and the ads they've run in the cycle and, and her conclusion is that the super PAC ads are less truthful by and large, on average. And she, she has numbers of something like 30, a third of their ads include factual inaccuracies. Um, the most famous of this is the, the ad that ran heavily in South Carolina and some other states against Newt Gingrich saying that he had basically supported funding for abortion in China, which just wasn't true. Um, Mitt Romney was able to stand on stage and say, I have no idea why that ad's running. I don't know anything about that ad. There was no reputational cost to him, even though it was being put up by Restore Our Future. Um, I wonder not just in the presidential, but on some of these down ballot races, um, you have the real potential to move local elections or smaller elections with false information like that. Um, and there will, and there's, because it's coming from super PACs, less accountability 
um, because you can't, it's, it's people for a better tomorrow. It's not my opponent who's saying it. You can't blame it directly on the opponent. There's one step removed. Um, and, I, and I wonder if uh, at the end of this race, when we look back at the ads that were run in the final few weeks, if we don't see some pretty slimy ads coming out of these outside groups. But, but two small things to add to that. One is that TV stations actually can refuse ads that they consider libelous. Uh, for if, if they're coming from an outside group, they can't refuse ads from, from uh, candidates. And uh, Kathleen Hall. They almost Hall, never do. They almost never do, although there have been a few instances in this cycle of them, of them doing it. And potentially, those groups can be sued for libel uh, in a way that candidates can't be, which is another point that Kathleen Hall James makes. If they're not a shell corporation. If they're not, right, right. I mean, <laughs> that, that's the other thing. They disappear, they, you know, they form and disappear. Although, uh, again, the libel barrier for a public campaign right. and a public official, I mean, you can go pretty far in distorting someone's record or the facts about them without meeting libel. As, as, as a public should be. I mean, yeah, we okay. should have a higher. Implicit in this conversation, though, is something I think worth making explicit, and that is that we're used to races where candidates are broadcasting at each other. The, when I was involved in the McCain campaign last time, there was a lot of press attention to how negative John McCain was being. So we did you know, a survey of all of our ads and said that only 50% of them or less were negative. But people were hearing those, and that's the image they got. Uh, we then said, well, the Obama people were more negative than McCain. It's true he was running more negative ads because that's he had so much more money he could run the negative ads and still run a bunch of positive ads. But that's been what we're used to, the idea that there's going to be a mix of positive and negative and that candidates genuinely worry that they're going to be seen as being too negative. Uh, and so they have reputational risk and election risk uh, at stake in their ads. The super PAC ads don't have the same risk. We don't know who these people are. We don't much you know, care what we think of them. And they are 99.9% .9 negative. It, it is not a 50-50 mix. What we hear out of the super PACs, because those are the ads that move voters or turn off voters or suppress turnout, are a, almost 100% negative ads. Uh, and that, I think, is, is something that after the election, we, we need to think about as an effect of this new uh, campaign finance world is that the message the American people is, are getting full-throated uh, is both of these people are awful. And it's actually another argument I would have against the interest of anonymity in public speech. You know, they're, they're, it, they're, even though there's, I agree there's an interest, it seems to me relatively small in comparison with the other interests at play. Um, if you allow one person to anonymously sully the debate in a, in a significant way, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a cost for that. Although surely these reputational mechanisms, while they're not as sharp with the super PACs, do still stand. That is, if there is a widespread perception that Romney does have at least some control or influence over what super PAC ads on his behalf contain, he'll be expected to stand up on the debate stage and repudiate the worst of it. But that, that happened several times in the primaries. And and Romney stood on the debate stage and said, I haven't seen those ads. I wasn't involved in making them. I don't know anything about them. Gosh, gee. You know, and, and, and he... But it, the fact that he was asked the question at all means that this is not something no, that right. the candidates are just going to be able to say, la, 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 I don't know anything about no, that's this right. forever. And there, and there right? So there, there are, this is, as you say, an evolving... And there, and there are also clear cases where candidates have come out against ads done by super PACs on their behalf, and then the super PAC pulls the ad. And that happened also in the primaries. Um, so there is a burden. I, I agree with you. There is a burden on the candidate to publicly disavow things that are uh, slimy and false uh, and said in their support because they can, they do have a direct effect. I agree with that. A Not to get us off on a tangent, but I, I always like when people worry about whether campaigns are getting more negative, I always like to cite the, uh, the accusation against Jefferson, uh, which was made that he was a hideous hermaphroditical character possessing neither the strength of a man nor the gentleness of a woman. Uh, and this was, this was something that was made in you know, an official opposition newspaper at the time. Uh, so you know, this, this is not to say that we, you know, it would be nice if our, if our campaigns were nice, but that, that you know, pretty hideous smears have always been part of the political landscape, and, and yet our democracy has yes, survived. But, um, that's absolutely true. Um, and so the, the partisans who bought those newspapers knew they were buying the Republican or the uh, Federalist paper. Although they may uh, not have known who was paying for them. That's correct. They only knew the, the, the paper existed in its, in its uh, corporate form and its, its name, but they knew it was a party uh, partisan one way or the other. What's different, I think, is today 
that's a, you know, a paper that you can read if you choose. Uh, it takes a relatively small piece of your day to read. You look at the advertising that's out there, particularly in the swing states, and it's becoming increasingly the only advertising on TV. So that I think it's much more uh, I intensive and invasive. A and if it is entirely negative, I'm not saying that the speech is more negative than before. I'm saying there's just a lot more of it. And you look at a democracy and say, how does that affect us post-election when one of these people is going to be the winner? And there's also, it's Catherine, there's, there's a ton of speech out there. I mean, the kind of thing you're talking about, I mean, there's tons of stuff on Daily Coast, and there's tons of stuff on Red State, and all kinds of stuff gets said, and it's not going to be regulated, and plenty of it is anonymous. We're really talking about a very specific thing where people are putting money into organizations to influence the election to typically, although I think there may be some shift on this, typically by broadcast advertising to get to people who aren't going seeking out Daily Coast or seeking out Red State or other yeah. Let's go Beardy. <laughs> there were two of them. Oh, there's a couple of Beardies back there. Sorry. Sorry, Beardy number two. Nathan, Nathan Kaufman. I'm a GW Law student. Uh, a group that hasn't been discussed in this conversation is uh, political professionals, campaign operatives, who benefit enormously from this influx of outside money. Uh, to what extent does their benefiting from this money present a hurdle to either a constitutional amendment or some kind of movement to bring more uh, transparency or what have you to the system. We, we, we have the, the Committee for Responsible Hacks. We'll start running ads. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, save our industry. I, I think uh, these guys are making money on the net. They're making money on the amount of money that goes into the, uh, the political space. So uh, it, I don't think it's the case that they all, I mean, several of the senior Romney strategists would much rather um, have control of this money and the super PACs not have control of this money if they could. Other strategists have different interests. Um, I don't think they as a group have much lobbying power in, in Washington to influence or prevent. I mean, the, uh, the bigger issue is the, is the politicians themselves who feel it would be against their interest to restrict super PACs or to, you know, to, to uh, allow outside money to come in and, and maybe unseat them. Um, but I, I don't do see it. I've always been interested in whether, in effect, it's the consultants who push campaigns to say, you know, you need to be spending this many gazillions on TV, you know, which is where they're, you know, the, the guys who buy horse farms in Virginia are, you know, they're not opposition researchers. They're always the media buyers who get their, their cut. And some campaigns have begun to, the Obama campaign notably, I think, you know, really cracked down on some of the, the, the take they were getting. But in, in a sense, if that weren't so lucrative, maybe campaigns would allocate their spending a little differently, and there might be more going to grassroots or other things like that. Well, there's just a world of difference between working for a campaign with a budget that has trouble raising money with a cantankerous candidate who cares how it's spent or wants to know why that costs so much versus, working, wor versus working for yourself. Uh, where you get to go out and find people who will, you know, get, hand you money and you can pay yourself what you want, take the commissions you want, uh, run the ads you want, and you don't really report to anybody. Uh, it's a great world. That sounds good. We although, <laughs> although these super PACs, I think, the ones with the highest, you know, that Restore Our Future and uh, American Crossroads are run by very reputable professionals, and they're collecting those large checks based on those reputations. Like, they, yeah. they're, a rep, they're a place where these very wealthy people can go and feel comfortable that their million dollars is going to be spent well and not blown on, you sure, know, no, no. They're, they're boat the, trips. They're the gold-plated party establishment. That's right. They're the shadow party committees, right. uh, and that's why they can raise the money. Hi, uh, Dave Price. I'm just a retiree who has plenty of time to come to these things, and I really enjoy it. So first, I did want to commend the panel. I think you did something very difficult. You did take a murky topic and make it a little bit clearer. So my first question, I just have two very brief. First one is to Trevor. We've talked about corruption. As Stephen Colbert's attorney, do you have any um, belief that he might take some of that super PAC money and try to influence the Emmy so he finally wins from, uh, <laughs> from John Stewart after 10 years of losing? You're not worried about that. Uh, but here's my question. Obviously, it's going to be difficult to change. This is a time when, th things are, when things are so polarized. But with the new technology and the net and all those kinds of things out of the, there, where everybody has kind of their access, they, can, they say that. You haven't really addressed that as, as kind of a dissuading factor, an offsetting factor. It certainly doesn't equal the money. We know that. But uh, if I go home tonight, 
I can do whatever I want to as many people as I can reach. So that's kind of different again, going all the way back, and I love your quote from Jefferson, I use that too. Um, it does make it different, okay? Th somebody had to, Ben Franklin or somebody had to set that into print, and now all you need to do is push a few buttons and you really do have this unlimited almost speech that can reach as many people to read it. So how does that fit in against Citizens United? And that I, type I of think thing? the small dollar story, first of all, is a technology story. Obama can't raise that money without technology, and this is all new. Um, the net is a little different than a newspaper, right? The newspaper, it's true, you can go make, write a blog post, say whatever you want, and then an infinite number of people could read that blog post. The thing is, no one will know that you wrote that blog post and no one will come to your blog post unless you put money behind it or have a way of promoting it. Or, so there's still the, the, the similar barriers. I mean, you, you can strike it lucky if you do a viral thing, it can take off. But it's not, it's not exactly the same. It, you, you can't just say your printing press is now as valuable as Restore Our Future's printing press um, because you have access to you know, WordPress or something like that. It, it's a little more complicated, I think. Than that. The question surprised me. I thought you were going to say we took a murky topic and made it murkier. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. That would be the wrong analysis. Yeah, I mean, the thing about, the thing about that, your, you know, your blog post is, the, who's not going to read it is that swing voter who's not paying any attention to politics. And that's really what, what matters there. But the small donor story is fascinating because what the small donor story does, small donor technology does, is it makes it possible for the, you know, you've, we've all gotten so many emails asking for $3. You know, nobody, nobody ever in 1994 asked for $3 because there was no point in asking for $3 because it cost just as much. It might be good to know that you had a supporter, but it cost just as much to go back to them. So they only asked you for, you know, if you got one of those envelope, direct mail things, it would like suggested 75 or 150 or something like that. The value of being able to ask for $3 and then you can go again and again and all you, all you need is the email. You go again and again and again. You get people to sort of what they can actually give. You're sort of pricing them. You know, if, if what I can give is 150, I'll get there, or, or whatever. It's brilliant, and it really uh, has, has had a real transformational power in, in making it worthwhile for candidates to seek small donors. And that's why I think so, you know, solutions that are based on encouraging small donors are really uh, the future in a way that they couldn't have been in 1994. Can you just uh, sort of tell the story for me of why these small donors are ultimately good? That is to say, you know, if we have if we have uh, you know a hundred three dollar donors mm -hmm. versus one three hundred dollar donor, how how is that better for democracy? Well, it's a, it represents a broader base of support, a broader range of interests. It is that easier. People were voting for Obama anyway. This is not this is not changing right. people's well, well, votes. Has a, an answer to that is that um, you that candidates and campaigns love to have small donors because if they actually invested their money, even if it's three dollars, they're much more likely to vote. They're much more likely to talk to their neighbors about it. Uh, they, they, have they have made their investment. Uh, so one, and, and then uh, the campaign has their emails and it can urge them to get their neighbors to vote and it can ask them to volunteer. So that, that what you, I think the answer is both for the campaign and democracy. Uh, John McCain used to go on and on about this, talking about McCain-Feingold. He said the problem is, you know, we've ended up with these millions of dollars of ads being spent in Arizona and nothing else. Where are the people who used to come to the barbecues and knock on doors and drive people to polls and be the volunteers? That's what we want. And I, I think he's right that it, that is what you want in a democracy is an engaged electorate. And so getting them to donate is, is not only part of that, but then leads to these other things. What you don't want is a bunch of people who are just sort of dazed by the, the air wars uh, and stagger off to the polling booth if they haven't been sufficiently disillusioned. Well, I, I use another, can I use another, just, we, we yeah, go, 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 go. One more question, and Beardy number two has been so patient. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the difficulty of reporting on a system that has become so much more complicated in the last eight years, but especially in the last two years, with so many different players and so many different rules and different agencies. Um, I mean, we see every day 501c4s that are called super PACs. I mean, that's the, the basic level, but even talking about spending by a 501c4 as opposed to a super PAC and things like that, I've talked to many a journalist and you know, go into a, a five minute explanation and they say, well, how do you say that in 30 seconds? Um, so I wanna ask, I guess, particularly uh, Mr. Scherer, uh, 
about you know how would you rate the the media's uh, reporting of this in general? How could it be improved, or you know, is it bound to always be lost in the murkiness of the subject? I, I, one of the best things about super PACs is they have a name that sounds kind of super cool. Super PACs, and when you say 501c4, it's like you've already lost your audience. And like the individual <laughs> super PACs always have hilarious. Yeah, they always have. But but they, but and you know, it's funny. Like the media kind of adopts these uh, these handles to try and make what is very complicated explainable to the public. These sort of shorthand. Super PAC is what we used this year. Before, we, it was like stealth, stealth PACs in 2004, I think. It was the 527s were called stealth PACs. It sounded really cool, too. Um, or dark money. You know, people will talk about it. It sounds really cool. But I, I agree with you. It's, it's a huge uh, problem. I, I think you would agree that the agencies don't have their act together. Given what we have in terms of what technology can do, if the FEC was a functioning body and worked better with the IRS and Congress weighed in here and created some sane system of simple disclosure that could be easily presented. Right now, I depend heavily on open secrets I have for years to basically process a lot of this data so I don't have to spend a lot of time wading through disclosure reports. Um, and, and so the answer is we need groups like yours to do a lot of this, uh, the sort of the, the, the work in between. And there are a couple other groups to do it as well. Um, and, and we just have to keep trying. I mean, I think the, the problem is not, the, the bigger problem in the media is when we don't distinguish between the two, or we don't try and explain. It's not when we explain and people tune out, because that happens also. But the bigger problem is if you don't um, make clear that there, there are totally different rules for different sets, the rules are very complicated, and some groups are disclosing, that's the big difference. They're donors, and we know who they are. And then some groups, there's just this pot of several million dollars. We have no idea where it came from. If I can just say, as somebody who's primarily an observer, a reader of the journalism about money and politics, I think it's been extraordinary in this cycle. It's actually been really impressive. What Michael's been doing, what Michael's successor at Mother Jones, Andy Kroll, has been doing has been very good. Nick Confessori in The Times has been doing amazing uh, coverage. But the, 50, the 501c4 story, is it, you know, is, it's, it's kind of unprecedented. And this is not, you know, I've worked for a lot of nonprofits, so I've worked for a foundation. You know, 501c4s are supposed to be, they're nonprofits, and they're supposed, they allow some lobbying, they allow a little bit, they're really not intended to be used as political vehicles. That's not supposed to be their primary purpose. And no, no agency is prepared to, you know, the IRS is not prepared to suddenly deal with this thing that's, that's in their nonprofit zone, which is not really what they're supposed to be dealing with. That's the biggest thing that's happened. It's not, you know, it's just a b direct violation of what the intent of the tax, not the, not the campaign finance law, but the tax law of what 501c4s are supposed to be. But I agree with you. I, I think it really is complicated. I had a reporter interview me, and I started talking about 501c4s. He stopped me and said, excuse me, but my personal goal is never to mention the phrase 501c4 <laughs> in my article. <laughs> That's why Stephen Colbert was so good. He could actually manage to distill all this in the, you know, the four minutes and, and try to explain why you should care. Get, get Stephen Colbert to come up with a new name for 501c4. We could all start using it. <laughs> and here we can end on a point of bipartisan agreement. Stephen Colbert is awesome. <laughs> Thank you for coming, and uh, come up and ask your follow-up questions later on. Thank you.